to you live from our studios in Television City in Richmond. Graham Kennedy was our first homegrown television superstar. Well, we're a young, there. skinny, retiring kid from a working class suburb in Melbourne who does live television for five nights a week for over 15 years. Remember, if they're hurting, they're Merton. I get all this pussy and I just don't know what to do with it. It was a joke, Joyce. He's one of our highest earning, highest rating television icons who after all these years is still known as the king of Australian television. What I most like about Graham is that he's a rat bag. The title The King is right, I think. It, it, no one of that that occupied that sort of niche that he had did it any better. You had to have been there, really, to realise just how big Graham was. I mean, he was much more daring than anything, really, that's, that's made today. Early on, Graham took an instant dislike to me, no doubt about it. That has Willie inscribed on it, I'm not quite sure, sure why. Um, not sure why it's being worn on my wrist. And then you get in a studio with him live and it's almost like uh, you're with royalty. Although we wrote the film, we would never claim that we know Graham. And sets fell down, you know, smoke machines went wrong, animals disgraced themselves, it was wonderful. <laughs> When I first got the script, I said, oh, shit, who do you get to play Graham? Wait till you see him. He is, he's going to blow you away. That was a big show to the public, isn't it? It's, it's madness, and I'm loving every second of it. The King tells the story of Graham Kennedy from 1957 to the late, the late 70s, starting with his early days out on radio with Nicky Witter through to his days in IMT, and ultimately, uh, Blankety Blanks. But it not only shows um, what we saw on our television screens, it also shows um, facets of, of Graham's private life, his personal life, and, and um, some, of the, some of the obstacles, and also some of the, the wonderful things that happened to him. And now, here's Graham. When I first got offered this script, well, even before I even read the script, you know, question one, page one, top left-hand side of the page, who's Graham, you know? So, you know, we were always aware that if we didn't find the actor that could do that job, which is possibly one of the toughest briefs that, that an actor could get, uh, that we had no show. Thank you, thank you, Graham. I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of time. We, we do have Bongo the Dancing Dog waiting. Here, we want to get Bongo angry. Are you the biter? <laughs> the way I pitched the project was that I actually got a photo of Stephen from Showcast and uh, printed out his, his headshot, cut the headshot around the edges and actually put it on top of a picture of Graham and gave it to the network and uh, asked the network, who do you think that is? And of course they all fell into my trap and said, uh, oh, that's Graham Kennedy. And I said, no, actually, look, look a bit closer. And when they saw that it was actually Stephen Curry, they were well into, you know, commissioning the project. I got the role, which was which was great, and um, I was very happy and slightly freaked out. And then I got even more freaked out the next day when I was told that, uh, yes, your idea is great to drop a few kilos. We have a personal trainer. So this is at the moment three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'm uh, in here for an hour with my mate Matt here, who's, uh, who's punishing me. And uh, in the last what, and it's been about a month, I've lost six kilos. Three thousand. Oh. Have a great time. Not many people know this, but Graham Kennedy was a very, very good boxer. He was the um, he held the world title from 87 to 92 in the heavyweight. Him and Aussie Joe Bugner had a pretty rough kind of rivalry going on. Our first real insider that we talked to was Mike McCall-Jones, who was 
Graham's personal rider for many, many years. Graham had a lot of problems with riders, and you know, one of the few that he really worked well with was Mike. And um, I think there was enormous mutual respect there. And uh, so we met him at Channel Nine. And uh, the guy was, he was happy, you know, he was like very pleased about yeah, the whole thing. Took us on a tour. And, and we're thinking, this is great, you know, Mike's going to be a gold mine. And then a few days later, Jason rings us really worried and he says, oh, OK, um, I've gotten a call from Mike and he's not going to be involved any further with the project. You know, someone's gotten to him. <laughs> like, it's he's like been... the mafia. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, if people would talk to you, then you'd get a call a few days later going, uh, I was never in that room, you know, yeah. I can't go yeah. talk to you anymore. And it's like, it was, there was this incredible protection and this, you know, some people were really happy to talk to us and wanted to give us accuracy and other people just thought that talking to us was somehow hurting An act of betrayal. An act of betrayal. I guess Chris and Jamie had the brief from myself to, to write a script which celebrated the times and also the life of Graham Kennedy. On the other hand, we didn't want to make it a sycophantic sort of waltz down memory lane and, and you know, um, I guess part of Graham's brilliance was that he was a flawed character, you know, as a lot of people in the industry who do that sort of thing seem to be, like the rest of us. So we wanted to make it a, a, a journey which was an emotional journey and that sort of, you know, took away the layers of the Graham that everybody has seen already on, on screen and to sort of search and discover and, and um, I guess, expose something of the Graham that we didn't know much about. Let's see, do you want the news about my private life or the, uh, the article questioning whether my, my talent has waned? Well, once we knew the project was go, that we were really making the picture, the first thing we had to do was meet people who were really there, people who knew Graham. He wasn't a gregarious person, you know. I mean, a lot of people have said, oh, various things about Graham, but he really was, I think, a rather shy person. I couldn't say that I was very close to Graham. I really just admired him from afar, if you like. Enjoyed working with him because it was a thrill and an honour. And uh, generally the sketches always worked. So when you were part of something that was getting good reaction on the night and recognition on the street, oh, I saw you with Graham last night, that was funny. What's he really like? Well, you could never answer that. He did demand 100%. And if you weren't prepared to give it, he really didn't want to work with you. He was obviously number one. He was the king, and everything had to revolve around him. So once you knew your place, you were fine. He was very embarrassed about um, the title, the king. Um, you know, I think that um, he probably felt it put um, unreasonable demands on him. But at the same time, wanted all the trappings of being a star. You know, so it was a bit of a bit of a contradiction. We're a couple of weeks out now, and. Um, the excitement of getting the film up is now gone truly gone and now the pressure and the challenges and the hurdles are sort of quickly approaching. We've started off with a little yeah. bit of a young, a young Graham here and we, we morph into a little bit of an old Graham. A little bit of more wrinkles, you know, a little bit extra just for some of the ladies uh, who like a more esteemed gent. Pre is a very exciting time, but it's kind of like, you know, the, the calm before the storm, you know, you've got to make sure everything's in order so you don't waste any money once you get into the shoot. Um, so right now I'm sort of uh, taking phone calls from all the heads of the department about making sure that they, they're on top of things, um, that, you know, all the money that they've got is spent wisely and we actually end up seeing it on screen. Uh, we just had the read-through, went great. Uh, again, that's part of the process to make sure the script's really tight so we don't waste time filming stuff that we'll never need or, or use. So it's a really important time to make sure that, you know, we're well equipped to get into the, into the shoot and use our time wisely. Now, this is one of my favourite suits that, uh, that uh, Graham would have worn. Not actually that he wore, uh, but um, it's quite a shiny little number. If we go a bit lower? Uh, look, we haven't got time to go lower. I've actually got to go and get some rehearsals in. So, um, have a great day. And, oh, by the way, I go change it. Hands. Stay away. 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 Stay we come to all the locations that we will be shooting at. Gives everybody sort of an opportunity to sort of see what's, uh, how, you know, we might go about shooting it, how many extras do we need, how many shots we'll be trying to achieve at every location. It just gives it 
an opportunity for everybody to have the film in their mind and what we might be doing on the shoot day. This is Nana's lounge room that uh, will be played in the 1950s, so where Graham was actually raised by Nana. The technicians are here, the lighting department, the camera department, the director, just to go through the shots, explaining what is hopefully going to be achieved and how it's going to be dressed, so lighting issues, access issues, art department issues are all discussed at this point. And then what we can do is just shoot that TV as a play and shoot some reaction shots. The first draft that we did, because it was supposed to be quite a quiet um, process, you know, nobody wanted uh, no, they didn't want everyone to know we're writing the Kennedy film, so we were sort of doing it off archival material and written material. And then when we, when we were going into writing the drafts proper, we were allowed to speak to everyone, and so that changed everything. And suddenly characters were getting chucked out, new characters were coming in, you know, the whole storyline changed, and we've taken that through this last really intense period to today, where we finally, eight days before shooting, have um, handed in the final draft. At the moment, we are putting up a million, one million um, shooting schedules. Well, right here we are um, in the midst of the pre-shoot drinks. It's, it's fine for some who can kind of just do whatever they want and drink beer, but those of us who are on diets can't actually enjoy anything, but you know what, I'm just going to grin and I'm going to bear it. I'm just going to basically just take as much as time to just stay on the straight and narrow. I don't think you're an idiot if you don't get a bit nervous, you know, before you you start something like this, and especially this one. <laughs> it's the Graham Kennedy story. You know, you don't want to be the guy, you know, remembered as the guy that stuffed that one up. Day one of shoot, we find out that, um, that the King's Crown has been found in a junk uh, store with a $5 price tag on it. So um, don't say I don't do the big gigs. <laughs> What's, I think, hitting is everyone is the film won't be made again. This is the one time that his life will be shown on screen, you know, and a whole generation will find this is the way they'll know Graham will be during this film. And so we just hope that, you know, we've done it right and done him justice and respectfully and, um, and most of all that we can pull it off and not look really silly. I Susie Struth is the script supervisor. So one of her responsibilities is to supervise where I leave my script. One of the easiest ways to find lost scripts is to put the X on them. Wait, now I seem to recall it was last night. And the night before that, and do you know I think it was the night before that too? Oops. No. Wait, now I seem to recall it was last night. And the night before. Shall I take one? And so, uh, Madam Scott, uh, what do you call this delectable fish you so generously laid before us? It's chops and veg. Chops and veg is it French? This is the, uh, the first time that uh, Graham and uh, Bert meet at the uh, funeral of Nicky Witter. Nicky was uh, Graham's mentor, who suddenly died of a heart attack, and uh, Graham's on his way to the funeral. And uh, Bert, who, who knows about Graham, uh, introduces himself to Graham for the very first time. You knew Nicky? Met him only once. You know what the Irish say? You should always go to other people's funerals, so or... they won't go to yours. Mm -hmm. I think they had a very similar sense of humour. They were both. They were just both sort of working from the same page, and you can also see that even in the feed lines and stuff, they were generous to each other. There is a the quote from Graham about, a wonderful doesn't time. matter where the laugh comes from, but as, as long you as know, it comes. You know, if, if Burke gets the laugh, been. or if Graham gets the laugh, that's not as important mm. as the fact that it's all bubbling along and um, everyone's having this sort of scripted anarchy. Action! Oh, 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 I just can't. Get rid of all this pussy, there's too much of it. Ah! Ah! You know, it looks much smaller when it's on its side. Ah, my pussy's collapsed! Is there a doctor in the house? You know, I'm, 
getting into some serious pussy news, Dash. My man's coming to say this. She's going to be impressed if there's all this pussy everywhere. Isn't she? <laughs> Thank you. With live performance, you're flying by the seat of your pants, and that's the way it was with Graham all those nights a week. He was there constantly, night after night after night, delivering the sort of top-notch entertainment we look back on so affectionately today. Speaking to, to, to Bert, for instance, you know, he was saying, I said, it, was, it was like the day after one of those specials, and I said, I loved that special, it was fantastic. It just seemed like he had so much fun, and he said, yeah, he said, that's, that's, that's the joy of putting 13 years into, into two hours. You are going to find good material <laughs> by sifting through it. But yeah, I don't know, I, I, I just don't know how he did it. Um, I, 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 I couldn't do it. I hope you really enjoy it. So, how are things shaping up? Studio audience. Well, Colin Bednall is the character I play, and Colin was the, um, was the man who, I guess, he, he's the one who got together the, the pitch for Channel 9 to get the licence from the government. Uh, so he's a, an ideas man and a, quite an innovator in terms of uh, television in this country. He saw the potential of it and he's the one who ushered it in. The bed of two sleeps. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I, I don't know the first thing about television. Well, I'll let you in a little secret. Nobody knows the first thing about television. I love the irony, the fact that I'm playing somebody who... <laughs> who knows television so well, given that my own experience with Channel 9 lasted 13 weeks, and he managed to usher in, a, among other things, a Tonight Show that ran 13 years. Hello, I'm Bert Newton. Big deal! <laughs> what a terrible thing to say. The art department and the designers have done a terrific job. When you see the costumes and the, and the guys, it, it's just... Quite eerie. It, it's I, it, your first impression walking in on the set is that this is working. This is going to be a, a really nice story, and it, it is the best story in Australian television. Got to say, my reaction when I first read it was that it was a big story arc because of the spread through the years. I thought that the probably the basic, basically the biggest challenge would have been that we were going to have a fairly tough time with the introduction of television scenes. And I went down to see Barry Bell at Channel 9, the stills photographer, from the, who still works at Channel 9. He, he was on set when IMT first went to air, went back into his archives and got me out photographs of all the original sets. Um, from those photographs, which were in reality photos of Graham, there's enough background detail for us to work out what the sets were like had discussions with other people who'd been working on um, at Channel 9 in the early days, including Bob Phillips, who was the floor manager there, and some of the old carpenters, um, and we worked out colours and shades from there. So with people like Barry Bell helping and Bob Phillips um, helping with uh, what he could remember and also his practical equipment, very soon we started having a fairly big body of research. We're looking at uh, reshooting the uh, Tim and the Boots scene and making it a night scene. But it would mean it would probably take us about three hours to uh, shoot, which will be three hours overtime on uh, this Friday. So uh, I'm the most unpopular producer in Australia right now because uh, I've uh, asked for us to reshoot a scene uh, tomorrow night. Uh, they've already shot the scene during the day, but I, I think uh, in retrospect it works much better at night. So uh, yesterday I made the big decision of calling everybody back tomorrow night on a Friday night to shoot at night, just because I think it's going to be a, a much better scene uh, under, the, under the cloak of darkness. There's a scene in the film where Graham actually puts um, one of his um, lovers into the boot of his car, which I know people are going to watch and go, that's ridiculous, but that was, that was from research. I mean, the wild, some of the wildest stuff that you see in the film was, did come from research and did come from friends and, uh, and co-workers. There's a great story about when, um, when I was, Graham Kenny was at the height of his career and uh, the year that JFK got assassinated, um, John Kennedy. Um, the nine switchboard was inundated with phone calls. People thinking that they, when they saw the headline Kennedy dead, that Graham had actually passed away. And once they were told that no, no, it's okay, it's, it's JFK, the, the President of the United States, they were much relieved. Graham created a situation where you weren't going to miss the show. 
um, you know, if you're talking in the office or going on the train the next morning, that um, the topic of conversation was, uh, I just hear what Graham said last night. The adulation was unbelievable. I mean, he couldn't walk down the street, he couldn't go to a restaurant. Everybody's wanting to see him, speak to him, touch him, everything. I mean, there were people hanging over the fence, trying to get into the house. We used to joke about it and say, as Sharabang's of pensioners coming down at the weekend, there were almost busloads, hordes of people saying, that's his house, that's his house. My mother was really a huge fan of, of his. Um, she grew up in Melbourne and um, she told me that she, uh, she and her girlfriend hitched to Frankston to you know, stand outside his house and have a look at his house. <laughs> and, um, and she used to go in and, and be part of the TV audience. Oh my God, there's Bob Dyer. Would you like an introduction? I wouldn't know what to say to him. Oh, what about, uh, hello, Bob? How's your box? I think that Val Wesley really knows Graham well and knows his vulnerabilities and um, really is very fond of him. And I think there's a lot of trust between them. You know, I think he really relied upon Val and John Wesley um, for his family, really. So it's a really nice relationship that they had. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> John represents for Graham, I think, that that kind of the the non the world beyond television, the world that he's not has nothing to do with television. And he can come home and, and because there's a there's a point where uh, John and Val move in with Graham and, and there Graham used to apparently say that they they were the happiest times of his life when he was just hanging out and he wasn't in the television world and, and he was able to just kind of be himself around John and Val. Just while you're waiting for your house to be finished, why don't we uh, go away together? Uh, we all got on so well because John and I had nothing to offer, nothing other than ourselves. We were not in the business. We felt as if we were in the business, but we weren't, you know? So we, we just were there because we all liked each other very much, loved each other very much. Mm. As friends. Brought to you by the world's smallest digital SLR from Olympus and St George, where customer service actually means looking after people. The brief, I thought, was in order to, to do him honour, we had to be bold. On every level, in every department, in, in, in terms of the production design, the costuming, the way it was directed, the way it was photographed, but most importantly, the, the way it was performed was to be unafraid. It's not a look-alike competition, and it's not, let's see who can do the best Graham Kennedy impersonation. It was about embodying that, that man. I've watched a whole lot of stuff on Graham Kennedy and, and probably too much stuff, and I did my head in a bit. I think you, once you go to the point where you say, OK, I'm not going to do mimicry, um, you have to decide what, how far are you going to go with the character. Looking at all the stuff of Graham, it'd be, it's impossible to, to get every mannerism and to get every kind of nuance and all that sort of stuff. So I just decided to kind of get an essence of him and uh, a rough kind of physicality and um, a couple of little tricks. You know, his tongue was, let's face it, overactive. <laughs> it's like, um... She's got no control over it. Meet the uh, producer, the removalist, Harry and Miller. Harry. Harry's been around sort of uh, the industry and parts of the industry for a long time and really colourful character, fantastic character and uh, unstoppable. Because there's a rascal about Harry that's just really appealing. <laughs> Graham, what's happening? You've been on holiday for over a year now. I have a top-rating radio show. Yeah, and you do it from your bedroom, which is appropriate since you sleep through it. Harry did say to me, I set up a meeting with him before I did this, and I told him I was going to play him. And I guess the only person, in a way, I've got to impress is him. And he said, yeah, he said, you could do me. I have a responsibility to inform you about every serious <laughs> offer, even if it's TB. You know, the, the question of gut crime sexuality, we were never sure how we were going to play that, how we were going to handle it in the film. We didn't want to offend people, but we wanted to be truthful. And we were, we were playing with different ideas. And then finally, John Michael Housen actually said to us, it's not a disease. And um, at that moment, we realised, you just got to do it. You know, we just tackle it head on. It wasn't an open subject in those days. It was entirely different. And people like Graham lived in fear of being blackmailed. 
And he was extremely good, I think, at covering the fact that he was homosexual. The word we used was camp in those days, of course. Is Graham really camp? I'd say, no. I'd love some money, a couple of dollars for every time that was asked. I would just lie my head off and say, absolutely not, don't be stupid. Evans, no. I think one of the strengths of the film is that the way that it handles um, uh, Graham's sexuality. I think that uh, in the context of the times that people t who were gay, people who, who were homosexual, I think there's a real fragility about that. And I think the way it's treated in the script is, is fantastic. It's a very special location today. We're actually at the church that uh, Charlene and Jason got married at uh, on Neighbours all those years ago. You kind of still feel the magic. There's Jason now. He's changed a little over the years. He's not looking after himself like he used to. He comes back here occasionally just to see if Charlene has come back. Yeah, it's been a great shoot, but it's been really, really tiring. And because um, we've just been flat out every day, we haven't had an easy day. Generally shooting five or six minute days. Uh, takes it out of you and the heat as well. So it's been quite hot. So yeah, I could do with a break. I'm sort of running out of ideas too. I've got to go watch some DVDs and get some more ideas off other filmmakers. Is it too late to maybe no. reach us? Is that you, Sean, blogging that uh, particular site? Well, I've... Uh, no, 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 I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> is it too late? I mean, we are it's pretty much a late. week down. It's just time of the day. I'm right here, I mean... <laughs> well, hang on. No, no really, it, my performance has come a bit, no, really, it's just these glasses. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> let me work up a... a I have a feeling you'll be fine. <laughs> Right. I'll be you, hang on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually very good. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm not just saying that because I'm smart, because I wear glasses. <laughs> I actually they think that performance yeah. is amazing. <laughs> well done. Well, we're breaking for Christmas for two weeks. Uh, it's 22nd today, and by the 8th of uh, January, uh, carries on a promise to gain 13 kilograms. We're going to help you kickstart the uh, the process and uh, I should unwrap it now. And, uh, is, is this what I... It is I have a feeling that this is... Wait, you've lost 10... What is it? lost 15... Oh, shit. 15 Ks? Yeah. Time to put it back on. Ah, oh, hang on. It is, isn't it? I've never had any before. They come in here. <laughs> Fantastic. Let's all eat How some Krispy Kremes. It's a good idea, actually. How many can... Uh, oh, stick my lord. Here's a challenge. What's it taste like? A cloud. <laughs> oh, no! Look at that. That is sensational. Sure. You want a Krispy Sure. Oh, I'm going to lose one. Get a celery stick or something. Oh, yeah. oh thanks, mate. Come here. Oh. Thank you. Well, such a good job. That is magic. He doesn't this know is... that's how we're paying him in donuts. Mm. I'm going to be a glutton. My word. Because I've yeah, spent the lot. last three months not being a glutton, and now I'm going to be a absolute <laughs> glutton. Yep. I'm not going to make any excuses about it. <laughs> I'm just going to be a pig. Christmas has been magic. I've uh, eaten, as you can probably see. See that? I've been eating quite well. Uh, put on 10 kilos, or 10 kg, as they call it in the biz. Uh, and uh, yes, I've enjoyed myself. A lot of beer, a lot of cricket, uh, a lot of donuts, and um, just a hell of a lot of uh, sitting on my ass. I enjoyed it. I'm ready, Big Daddy. I'm ready. Let's give it a red hot go. Over. Same speed as before. Same speed as before. Done like a dinner. Excuse me, business time. Bag it up, boys. We're here at Coldstream, which is doubling up for um, Bow in New South Wales, and we're, we're lucky that it's rained over Christmas. The grass is green. It's been a great day, a lot of stuff, lots of wigs, lots of wardrobe changes. We've had uh, Jane in today playing uh, Nolene. 
and uh, Steve Bisley, of course, has flown down for the shoot. And, uh, yeah, it's a big day to come back to, but um, all in all, it's gone really, really well. Whoa! I mean, I can, I can um, super glue them. It'll just take, like, a couple minutes. Gaffer. 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 Now, this, this is Australian film industry at its best here. Look at that. Look, Look at this. that. In the States, up in the States apparently, they have, like, spare shoes and stuff. <laughs> nah. No. Not here. Gaffer. Gaffer tape. Look at that. Yeah. Do you reason gaffer tape can't do it? Not long. You know, Nolene was one of the few people that, I guess, Graham allowed into his life maybe a little bit more. We've sort of taken a line in the, in the script that, that she was someone who wasn't trying to get somewhere career-wise through Graham and, and didn't take his bullshit and, and all that stuff, and I think that was probably perhaps the foundation of that, that friendship. Trent, what's that? It's a cow, Graham. I just heard Steve Bisley, who was in the original Mad Max film, talk about uh, Mel Gibson as Gibbo. I love this. I love show business when you uh, hear actors talking about famous actors in that way. Yeah, yeah, that was Gibbo. You did neither with him? Yeah. Yes. He hasn't done much since, really, has he? He's going nowhere. <laughs> going nowhere. And, you know, when the acting thing finishes, he's probably got no more strings to his bar. It's nothing. Because he wants his looks go. Oh, his looks, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an awful, an awful day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> his best days are behind. <laughs>
What do you call the stuff you put on the face? Patty? Um, it's it's an aging makeup. An aging makeup. I don't think Which it has a name yet. It's a new product. Any, any time that you do anything with your face, instantly <laughs> you become crinkly. <laughs> All films, particularly biopics, have a kind of a, a, a dramatic linchpin moment, oh. and it's it's usually a high dramatic Ray point. Ray gets blind. Yeah, um, the Fulsome Prism, you know, gig in in Walk the Line. Andy Kaufman does the Mighty Mouse. Exactly, and for us that was the crow call. You know, that dramatic moment in Graham's life after which there was no turning back. Now a word from the lovely Rosemary, who's going to tell us about something. I was shooting the crow call today. Very exciting with uh, Steve. He's about to uh, portray this uh, watershed moment in Australian television history. And to my left, Kathy Godwell, who's the son of Royal of Rosemary Morgan, who is her real mother. I guess one of the uh, the blackest nights in uh, in Australian television. It was sort of inevitable. He wasn't happy with the with the show. He wasn't really happy at being. Uh, been back on television and he was determined to push people including the broadcast control board and also the, the nine network management you know i questioned graham about how far he could push things and he uh, his only response was bob trust me Please. i was in the control room when he did it they couldn't believe what they just heard and uh, of course, you didn't have the seven-second delay, so you couldn't edit anything. What happened, though, was Adelaide pulled the pin and uh, Graham could never perform live on air again. From that night on, we pre-recorded and then started a, a period where um, he was edited on many occasions and eventually it was the, the end of the Graham Kennedy show and uh, what a lot of work. So it was a sad time because I think that um, Australian Variety lost their biggest star uh, but he went on and obviously became a, a film actor and blankety blanks happened and uh, lots of other things. Dick got so drunk that when his wife came home he thought she was a turkey and he tried to <laughs> blank her. We always pitch the film as uh, Walk the Line meets Boogie Nights. Um, so a biofilm with the sort of, you know, the, the look and the feel of the sort of 60s and 70s. And once Stephen walked onto the set of Blankety Blanks in that, in that gear and Ugly Dave's there and Nolene's there, you just feel the film and the set just shift another gear. And for a lot of people, that was their first memory of, of uh, Graham was Blankety Blanks for a whole generation. That was their memory. So that was stunning to see and you could tell they were enjoying it way too much. <laughs> can, we say, can we say that? Is it? That's Was disgusting. You... That's disgusting, Arlene. <laughs> Wash your hands, Jeffrey. When I read the script to The King, I was very desperate to be involved in it. Unfortunately, they cast the role of Nolan Brown, so I ended up taking... Uh, Probably the most pivotal character uh, to Graham Kennedy's career, ugly Dave Gray. Now, Dave, Dick came home, he thought he was, he was so drunk, he thought his wife was a turkey, and so he tried to... Tried to pluck her. <laughs> That's what Dick did. Did Dick. Dick did. Clever Dick. <laughs> Hungry Dick. Oh, can, can he... He can't... We're off the air. We're already off the air. That's, that's a record. That's a... Yeah, it's a pivotal scene in the film. How many lines do you have? Uh, both of them. Yeah, two. Two lines. But uh, they are the lines of the film. And uh, neither of them were scripted. So uh, I thought the writers were out of their depth when it came to grey-esque humour. My preparation for it, I learnt a lot of Ugly Dave-esque <laughs> jokes. So I've got some real... Corkers, two flies walking along. One looks to the other one and says, uh, look, "Don't look down, but I think your human's open." Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Nightline. Hello, Phil. Hi, Bruce, and hi, folks. After an absolute cauldron of a day in the city. Yes, had still mm, 35 degrees. Uh, I had the most remarkable day today, uh, one of the most enjoyable in our time together—17, 18 years, Phil. Yes. It took me back to Channel 9 <clears throat> 35 years ago as we sat in the ABV2 studios of the ABC and watched a marvellous recreation 
of Channel 9 and Graham Kennedy, the King, with the great Stephen Curry. Yes, uh, he is Graham Kennedy. It was uncanny. I sat there and it was a, so emotional, wasn't it? Because it took oh, us yes. back to our... We were back there. It exactly. was the day you were talking to him. Very much so, yes. The way he was dressed and that look in the eye. But his, his mannerisms, that was the key. Mm. It's not necessarily an impersonation, but the mannerisms and the look. Do you know they're doing this shoot in 20 days? That's, it's that's absolutely remarkable. amazing. And there was so much enthusiasm in the, mm -hmm. in the young crew, the writers, the producers. Yeah. They didn't know Graham Kennedy. They didn't work with him, but they were they were just so fascinated with the era and so proud to reproduce yes. on film for Foxtel. And the young people wanted to know, didn't they, about the IMT days and Graham Kennedy. What was he really like? Well, that's right. And then this will really show you, in no uncertain manner, the king. And I think if Graham were alive, he would be proud of the effort. He'd and, never and, say so. And he wouldn't admit ever seeing it, but he would uh, begrudgingly say, that's not bad. Mm. And uh, he would say, Stephen Curry, I'm proud of you. I met Val Wesley um, uh, in the last week of the shoot, and she's just a gem. Good to meet you, Val. Yeah, great to finally it's meet you. It's quite seeing you. Oh, yeah. Meeting Val was, was great. She was just, she's just such a, 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 a really lovely, open, charming, friendly, unassuming woman, and she's, she, you know, she had so much to offer this production, and she did, and she, she's been, I think she's been invaluable to the production. With our cosies on this project, they were all authentic um, period costumes. We didn't have anything made. Um, Graham Kennedy was an icon, and we wanted to make it um, as real and realistic as possible. The essence of what he wore, we've, we've captured, I think, pretty well, really. Coming back after Christmas, it was so hot, and he had to wear, you know, Dacron sort of padding and, and you know, perform and keep it together. No one's being honest with me. I reckon you can see that I'm wearing a fat suit. <laughs> Jason, our producer here, he lied yeah, to me. Okay. He reckons you can't even see it. Can you see it? He just um, made everything work so well. You know, there was no kind of, you know, fear that... I guess your biggest fear is you don't want the costume to wear the actor. It's got to really, you know, they do have to feel like that character and make it work and he just did everything he slipped into was just fantastic and he made it come to life look how do i put this physically a man has to decide whether he's going to go that way or if he's going to go that way or if he's going to go that way and i've gone at this stage yeah once we see the there we go. There we go. Pretty much done. No secrets here. One big happy family. We're at the Bell Club School, which is uh, the school where uh, uh, Rome as a young man attended. Uh, this is day 20 of 20. Uh, that is, it's the last day of uh, principal photography. So yes, it's been a really, really, you know, fun shoot, great shoot, great crew. I know that all the usual superlatives and that's, you know, fashionable to say that, but I actually, actually mean it. It's been a pleasure to work with all of the, all the cast and crew. We're doing the last shot. Cut there, last three. Check the gate. Yeah. 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 That's all right. I want the people that knew of Graham Kennedy, that, that watched him every night of the week, on television to see a side of him that wasn't on screen, his private life, to see how complex, how driven, how hardworking, how difficult, how funny, how sad, how amazing that man was. I think more than any other performer I can think of, Graham was a mystery. He's an enigma to people. They know him so well and yet, you know, they, they, they don't know the first thing about him. So. I don't think we've answered the questions. I don't think we know ourselves all the answers, but I hope this film will at least humanise the guy, you know, make him, change him from a screen presence to a real person. It's a classy film. I think you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. Assuming they have cable up in heaven or down in hell, wherever he is. He would say, in a fax form, nil interest. But underneath, he would be dying to see it and would lap it up. I think with the, um, with the end result, I'm, I'm really proud of it and uh, I hope that uh, the naysayers, the doubting Tom I, uh, agree.
I'm proud of this film because it's, you know, it's going to be a real surprise to lots of people. It's completely unique. It's going to really take people unawares, I think. They think they know the story, but watching this film will, will show them another another take on, on this great man's life. You're going to love this.